Cameron was out in Sochi for talks with Putin, and Putin gave him a, a personal tour of the Sochi Olympics, which they were building up for the Winter Olympics, the construction. About 50 British companies were involved in the construction. And Cameron and Putin said, yes, British and uh, Russian security services, amazingly, would work together on security for the Olympics. And then the following February, Cameron did not go to the Sochi Olympics because by then it was fairly obvious to him that Putin, I think, uh, was a bad hat. Um, and they had a bit of a row uh, at St. Petersburg in the previous autumn. And that was February 2014. And thank goodness Cameron didn't go because in March of 2014, Putin started his war on Ukraine. And that was the end of, I think, a rather ill-judged attempt by David Cameron at personal diplomacy, which started at the London Olympics. And of course, as ambassador for, uh, to Russia, uh, you'll remember, uh, and something William Hague has written about very entertainingly in The Times. Has, has written has written about in the Times um, uh, Putin's visit to London for the Olympics, watching the judo with uh, with half the government. Uh, yes, um, I think David Cameron's relationship with Putin was bookended by two Olympics, the London Olympics. Putin came after the Georgian War, after the murder of Litvinenko, at a time when he'd obviously gone to the bad. He was locking up people at home. There were a lot of demonstrations against her. Uh, he and Cameron seemed to get on while watching the judo. And David Cameron thought that he'd established some kind of a bond with Putin. And rather naively, he thought that through his personal relationship with Putin, he could get this guy to behave rather better. And then the following year, Cameron was out in Sochi for talks with Putin. And Putin gave him a, a personal tour of the Sochi Olympics, which they were building up for the Winter Olympics, the construction. About 50 British companies were involved in the construction. And Cameron and Putin said, yes, British and uh, Russian security services, amazingly, would work together on security for the Olympics. And then the following February, Cameron did not go to the Sochi Olympics because by then it was fairly obvious to him that Putin, I think, uh, was a bad hat. Um, and they had a bit of a row uh, at St. Petersburg in the previous autumn. And that was February 2014. And thank goodness Cameron didn't go, because in March of 2014, Putin started his war on Ukraine. And that was the end of, I think, a rather ill-judged attempt by David Cameron at personal diplomacy, which started at the London Olympics. And, and just before I let you go, Sir Roderick, um, observing uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the long uh, list of international dignitaries heading to Qatar uh, for talks, formal and informal, and of course, a bit of football too, uh, would you say, despite the controversy, uh, that the Qataris would think this has been a diplomatic success for them? Uh, I would have thought so. They've put a massive investment into it, but they have put themselves very much on the world map, not just as a provider of oil. Uh, and uh, they will, I think, feel that this has paid off in a big way. Yes, well, I suppose uh, the famous one is ping pong diplomacy, which was in 1971, at a time when China and America were really barely on speaking terms, and the red menace was about all that anyone thought about of China. And unexpectedly, the Chinese invited an American team to come over and join them in ping pong matches. Well, ping pong's quite a big thing in China. I can't say that it's that big a game in America, but it was significant because it was a real sort of reaching out and opening, and that paved the way for the groundbreaking visit uh, only seven months later of President Nixon to China, and after that, the whole rapprochement with China got going. Because because sport, you know, cordial sporting relations between nations can often, say, normalise uh, relations at a political level, can't they? They can, but they can go wrong. Mm. I mean, the famous one was 1914, the Christmas truce, when suddenly troops from both the German and British trenches got out and met in no man's land and played football. And everyone thought, gosh, you know, here at last we can perhaps get some reconciliation going. But the commanders on each side uh, were furious at this fraternisation and then uh, a day or two later ordered them back and firing started only a few days later. Mm. Well, well, let's stay on the constant, shall we? Um, you know, you've been uh, reporting at the Times for a long time time but not quite this long uh, the olympic games in 1936 is, is, is an example that's often evoked uh, you know when russia hosted the world cup in 2018 uh, there were comparisons made with the olympic games in berlin in 1936 which was used by hitler as a as a showcase uh, for nazism but also 
as you say, um, backfired when Hitler refused to meet Jesse Owens and the true nature of uh, Nazism's views on race was, was sort of revealed to the world at that point, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, everyone thought that the organisation was terrific and it was very uh, martial and military and, you know, plenty of flags and uh, it had impressed a lot of people. But, uh, as you say, uh, when Hitler clearly snubbed Jesse Owens, walked out because he wouldn't meet a black person, he wouldn't shake hands with a black person, that was part of... Hitler's racial ideals, uh, everyone saw that was a regime based on race hatred. Um, and, and obviously, um, the, there's, a, there's a choice when uh, controversial regimes host these events. Uh, countries can either go and, uh, you know, equivocate and make protests or not, as we've seen in Qatar. Um, England team and ended up not wearing the uh, the one love armband in protest or you can mount a boycott as happened in 1980 when Moscow hosted the Olympic Games. I don't think boycotts usually work. I mean the 1981 as you say was a, a global attempt to put pressure on Russia over the invasion of Afghanistan led by America. Uh, it didn't really work. The Americans boycotted, the Germans did, Britain officially boycotted but said that its athletes were free to go if they wanted and nearly all of them did go. So effectively it was a sort of fairly meaningless boycott. It left a sour taste in the mouths of the Russians. It didn't actually make much difference to the result because apart from the Americans, almost everybody was there. But it left a stain on the Olympics because the Russians in turn then boycotted the next lot of Olympics which were held in America. And I think finally the Games has got over this, this idea of boycotts. It, it just doesn't really work. And when, you know, when dignitaries uh, descend on a, on a city for the Olympics or a, or a World Cup... Are the meetings they have, the, the, the informal brush buys, the, the chats in the stands, can they prove just as consequential as, say, a, in, in their own way, as a, as a formal bilateral at a, as a G20 or, or a G7 or a, or a big international summit? Are, are these the sort of informal encounters that really, I guess, uh, solidify a relationship between two sides or can, uh, can break the ice of, of difficult international, uh, international relations? Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, it's just the right atmosphere where people are not focusing on the politics. You've not got this press uh, watching your every move and your every gesture. The press are looking at the sport, mostly, and these things can go on quietly in the stands if they're sitting near to or next to each other or just uh, sort of near the match uh, where they meet afterwards. And they can have some fairly meaningful discussions which are sort of more or less off the record but can break the ice and can do a lot in terms of advancing bilateral relations. And for a country like Qatar, um, obviously it's very influential uh, in its own way in 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 the gulf and um there you know has no shortage of attention in normal times but it's a once in a blue moon opportunity the, the entirety of the world and its leaders uh, have at some point passed through qatar in this in in this month it, it, in buying the world cup essentially as, as the allegation goes um, they have bought um effectively one long international summit and the uh, the attention of world leaders haven't they they have yes i suppose uh, more valuable to the world is the meetings between uh, statesmen who are not necessarily talking about Qatar. Mm. I mean, Qatar is, a, you know, a, a state that's really pushing uh, pretty hard and, and punching above its weight. But nevertheless, uh, more significant would be sort of meetings between, say, Chinese and Americans or between um, other countries, you know, France and, say, France and Britain. I mean, I think uh, the match uh, France-Britain will see some, some interesting diplomacy in the background. And, and and as you say, France, England, sorry, well, indeed, indeed, <laughs> indeed. As as you, as you as you say, um, you know, for a Chinese official to meet a, a, an American official quietly in Qatar, where lots of other things are, are happening, is is a uh, is a is a almost a, a better way to do it, or a more effective way to do it, quietly effective way to do it, than doing so in in hyper formal settings where you've got the the glare of the media on, upon you. Yes, exactly. And I mean, that's what statesmen seek and, and look for. And that's, that was the original idea of the G7. It was meant to be a fireside chat that mm. the French invited seven uh, leading economic countries to have a sort of quiet, informal uh, meeting uh, at, uh, in, in Paris. Uh, it's morphed into something much more formal and much more structured, which I don't think necessarily is better. But the original concept was exactly that. It was a sort of informal meeting where they could chew things over without actually being on the record. Well, one another man who is very familiar with these sorts of discussions is Sir Roderick Lyne, uh, Britain's former ambassador to Russia, who joins me now. Good morning, Sir Roderick. 
Good morning. Um, you have experience of uh, mixing diplomacy and sport. You actually set up a meeting uh, to ease tensions between the UK and Russia at an equestrian event involving Prince Philip, I believe. Tell us, tell us about that. Well, you're giving me too much credit for setting it up. What <laughs> happened was that in 1971, uh, the British government, then led by Ted Heath, threw 105 Soviet spies out of London, which is still a world record. And that led to a deep freeze in our relations for the next couple of years. Uh, it wasn't really to the Russians' advantage to maintain this. They were trying to get detente going, but they couldn't find a way to get themselves off the hook. And they weren't giving us visas, and they weren't talking to us, and they wouldn't have British ministers out. They cancelled an invitation to Ted Heath to come to Russia. Um, and they were sort of stuck. Uh, and we weren't going to offer them any concessions. And then it turned out that in the autumn of 1973, the European three-day event uh, equestrian championship was due to be held in Kiev, which in those days was part of the Soviet Union, happily not now. And the reigning European champion was Princess Anne. Royal family had never set foot in the Soviet Union because the Bolsheviks had murdered their relatives back in 1917. They felt a bit rough about it, though Prince Philip had always said he wanted to go there. Uh, despite the fact that they were, as he called them, murderous bastards. And um, he was the chairman of the International Equestrian Federation. So Princess Anne said she was going to come to defend her title. Prince Philip said as the chairman of the federation he was going to come. The government agreed that they could go as long as this was a private sporting visit, nothing official. So I was the poor dog's body in the Moscow embassy who had to make all the arrangements for this, uh, which was a royal pain. Um, but it all worked very well, and out they came. Prince Philip came to Moscow, and he was treated as if he was a head of state. He wasn't treated in the way he wanted to be treated as a private visitor. He was given a huge banquet in the Kremlin by President Podgorny and made to go through lots of very, very boring meals when he actually <laughs> wanted to have a bit of fun. Uh, but it worked, because then, in the course of all of this, the Russians said, oh, we'd love to have the Queen here. We'd love to have the Prince of Wales here. And, oh, yes, we would love to have your prime minister here. And two months later, Foreign Secretary came out and the hatchet was buried, all as a, a completely accidental result of this uh, sporting visit. And without, without, without the sporting event, uh, there would have been, as you say, no trigger for that discussion. And certainly, if... It, as we've been discussing with, with Michael Binion, um, making a request for bilateral talks is often fraught. It can be uh, interpreted as hostile. But when you have uh, you have the sport as a as a pretext for getting leaders around a, around a television or a, on a on a stand together, it's um, altogether more straightforward, isn't it? Well, it creates a different atmosphere. I remember in the early nineteen nineties when we were having quite complicated negotiations with the Irish government at the beginning of the peace process. We invited Albert Reynolds and his uh, deputy, Dick Spring, a former <laughs> Irish rugby international, to London for talks on the morning of an England-Ireland rugby match. Those were the best talks we ever had. They were in a fantastically good mood. We then all drove out to Twickenham together, sat in the Royal Box, uh, and then to put the icing on the cake for the Irish, we allowed them to win the match. <laughs> and that did an enormous amount of good for our negotiations. 